Hello, and thank you for joining us for Disability and Classical Music today. I am Roberto Samayoa of the Office of Accessibility and VSA at the Kennedy Center. My colleague, Sarah Berzio, and I will be your support staff for this webinar. And with that, I will hand this over to our panelists. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us today for an enriching conversation about disability and classical music put on by the Kennedy Center, Office of Access and VSA, and NPRs from the top. I'm Julia Legrand, and I am myself a blind violinist. I am so honored to be moderating our panel discussion this evening with four incredible panelists um, that bring a wide range of experiences in the music industry and beyond. But before we get started, I would like to quickly talk about the origins of this panel and what this event is really all about. About a year and a half ago, I came to From the Top with the idea of an episode featuring disabled young classical musicians. And because they are passionate about being youth led, they took the idea of a 17 year old seriously. Um, it was really important to From the Top and to me that this go beyond just a single episode and be part of an effort to expand from the top to become a more inclusive and accessible show. And from the top also wanted to provide further content relating to disability and classical music. The Kennedy Center's Office of Access and VSA have provided tons of support um, throughout our episode building process and now and as from the top builds this access programs as well. And this is culminating in two nights of fantastic content put on in partnership with From the Top's Learning and Media Lab and VSA. So tonight's panel is a chance for disabled and non-disabled musicians and non-musicians, anyone uh, to come together to hear a conversation about what it means to these panelists to be disabled musicians, how they present their identity to the world and how able-bodied allies can be effective and also just how the music industry can change to better accommodate um, disabled people. Uh, we will follow this up tomorrow evening with a space for anyone who identifies as a disabled musician to come for community building and networking and we'll be joined by three of our four panelists then as well. For now, uh, I'd like to get into the panel. So I will start by having each of our panelists introduce themselves. Can you start us off, Adrian? Hi there, my name is Adrian, and I'll just self-describe very quickly. Uh, I am an Asian male with slick back, dark hair. I am uh, zooming in uh, from Boston. I am a violinist, and I have a big smile on my face because Julie is here to uh, lead our way towards a very interesting discussion. So I'm very excited. Thank you. Awesome. Can you introduce yourself, Christina? Hi, my name is Christina Jones, and I go professionally by the Blind Soprano to keep myself honest. Um, I'm an opera singer, and I'm a performer, private voice and braille music instructor, speaker, and advocate for blind performers with disabilities. Um, <clears throat> I received my bachelor's of music in vocal performance from California State University of Fullerton and my master's of arts from the Royal Academy of Music and I currently live in El Paso, Texas and serve as a resident artist with El Paso Opera and I'm really excited to be here on this panel this evening. Wonderful. Uh, Lloyd? Hi folks, I'm Lloyd. Uh, I'm dialing in from uh, Bristol in the UK this evening. It's really lovely to be with you all virtually. Um, I am a musician and composer. I have uh, a hearing impairment and a vision impairment. So I'm really passionate about the subject of uh, inclusion, uh, particularly in classical music and uh, music more widely. And I suppose um, the, the thing that I do that is kind of most relevant to that is I am associate music director of a group called the Power Orchestra. And the Power Orchestra has been going for uh, a little over 10 years. Uh, it's a UK based ensemble of uh, disabled 
and non-disabled professional musicians and we're in the business of um uh providing a platform a a high level platform for disabled uh, performers to um allow their craft to to meet as, as many people as possible it's a great uh, great pleasure to be here and in this conversation with you all thank you so much ofira can you finish us off introductions yes hi um, my name is ofira and i use both they them and she her pronouns i'm so excited to be here um to give a short visual description of myself i'm a white person with short dark hair wearing uh plastic thick rimmed glasses and a white and navy blue neck brace i'm also a power wheelchair user i trained in classical voice and opera performance and today uh, I wear a lot of hats as a mu musician, artist, producer, director, writer, um, that I kind of group all together under the title of being a disability arts practitioner. And I'm calling in from Toronto, Canada. It is very cold and uh, I am very excited for this discussion today. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm really excited to hear about how your different perspectives um, and similar perspectives will just kind of make this a really engaging conversation. And I'd like to start by asking you each to talk about what it means to you um, to be a disabled musician and arts leader. And like, because I know, as you've just said, you all kind of have different roles. Um, but to start digging into that, can you tell us about your personal understanding or experience of disability and or musical joy? And can you start us off, Ophira? This is Ophira speaking. I would love to. Um, I think joy is something that I've come to a little bit more recently in my identity as a disabled artist. Um, when I first started started kind of coming to my disability identity. I was someone who was an artist and a musician and I found joy in that space. And I was really resistant to, to kind of embracing my disability as part of that process. Um, I moved forward thinking a little bit more about, okay, so I have to have some accommodations in order to access the joy and the beauty of, uh, of art. And as time has gone on, I find that my disability is a key part of my creativity. Um, to me, accessibility and disability, these are inherently creative. Um, whether we're figuring out our different ways to connect with each other, to share space, um, navigating a world that isn't necessarily built for all of us. And there's something in that itself that's so beautiful and that to me is musical. We sort of are all in this dance together in this process of figuring out how can we hold space for each other and connect together. And so I use the phrase crip the script to describe my personal practice of really centering disability at the core of my music and at the core of my art, thinking of how, how are we embracing all of the knowledge and experience and, and beauty and creativity that disability brings, not discounting the difficulty also of navigating a world that's not built for you because that's certainly there as well, um, but really finding space to celebrate the, the inherent art within within the community and what I feel within my identities as well. I'll leave it there because I'm really curious <laughs> about everyone else's thoughts. Yeah, this is Julia. Thank you so much. Um, that was a really powerful answer. And it's, it is such a, I think, such a complex uh, thing to address. What do you, what are your thoughts on that, Lloyd? I must say I, I I chime a lot with uh with what Afira says. Um thank you. Um I think I really agree with that idea of um musical joy being found in being able to embrace uh one's um identity as a disabled person and 
as a person in in many different ways be it race or or sexuality or gender or age uh ethnicity um i think actually as an artist we you know we to be uh to make our best work i think actually we have to be able to bring all of ourselves to a stage or a composition um and to not leave that behind off the stage because that would be um kind of doing a, a, a disservice to that you know to part of one's identity um i think there's also something for me about um bringing your kind of authentic self as well not having to erase um a disability and this is definitely something that i felt more comfortable um talking about as i've grown older as an artist um i'm really really lucky um I've come to realize that I've been very, very lucky and fortunate in that my in my formative years as a musician as a, and as an artist, I had some incredibly supportive teachers. Um, and I know that's not the case for for many of my colleagues, certainly in the power orchestra and, and elsewhere, talking with 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 colleagues who have different stories and different features of disability in their lives. Um, but for me, to give one brief example, when I was at uh, school, I had a clarinet teacher called Joe. And Joe, uh, in my first lesson with Joe, we confronted or met with this question of my hearing impairment um, head on. I was only 14 at the time when I started learning with Joe, and I'd been learning the clarinet for a couple of years. But what was so interesting about her approach and what I realised is, is been so formative in my thinking is that Joe really encouraged me to uh, not see my um, my hearing aids or my my hearing impairment as something to be um, sort of circumnavigated or to be kind of avoided, but actually something to be embraced in the process of learning how to produce a good sound. And if you think about it, obviously a clarinet or any woodwind instrument for that matter is, is a tactile instrument to play. You get this amazing feedback through the instrument itself, through your fingers. And so a lot of Joe's teaching over the next four years that I spent with her um, centred around really embracing and, and properly investigating that for me, you know, so that I could learn um, for myself what a good sound or a good technique actually felt like under my fingers as well as uh, some of the oral information that I was um, receiving through my ears and so that's then informed my my thinking all the way through my um, my uh, sort of early career as a as a performer and as a composer and I'm always interested when I meet other disabled artists who can pinpoint or identify where actually their disability might uh be able to see the world um, or experience the world or express themselves differently and I think that is then the route to um, kind of really interesting art and really challenging art. Yeah this is Julia that's I love both of you have brought up sort of enhancing your art um, through disability and really getting at the core of what art is um, through and using your disability to do that. Um, and that's just that's so interesting and thought provoking um, for me too. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, Christina, what what does disability or in musical joy mean to you? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, um, oh my gosh. So <laughs> everything that the two of you have said really, really rings true to me. And I was just like, oh my gosh, they know my soul. But um, I think one of the things that I'd like to add to that too, is that for me, um, one of the most important things, it, you know, including in being <laughs> included in all this is to, you know, surround myself with people who believe in me and are supportive of me. You know, I've, I've had a lot of, and I'm sure that all of us have, <laughs> you know, have teachers or, you know, colleagues or things like that, that, you know, will naysay or say, hey, you know what, this isn't very realistic to you. You're blind or you're disabled or you're this or you're that. And, you know, I think um, I, I just decided a long time ago, not too, too long ago, <laughs> but relatively recently, <laughs> that um that i was only going to work with teachers or work with directors or work with um 
people who believed in me. And if they didn't fully believe in me, were at least curious, you know, and I think um, for me, one of the things that I, I find joy doing is um, allowing directors and, you know, the people around me to ask me questions, you know, and uh, talk to me about, you know, accommodations and talk to me about what they thought, a, you know, a blind person specifically in the opera field uh, couldn't do in terms of, uh, you know, uh, running around on stage and things like that. And one of the things that I love doing too is um, being able to play a character that isn't necessarily blind, but finding different ways to make that character work for me in my situation, like finding little accommodations, because I know that realistically, um, not all characters are going to be blind. Um, you know, I'm not always hired to play blind people, <laughs> but you know, which I don't necessarily want that. But at the same time, if if I feel like it calls for um, it, I'm happy to make a character blind and I'm happy to also um, justify that left, right and center. So I think um, that's that's what really, really gives me joy. And I think once upon a time, uh, you know, I really had I, I really struggled with trying to hide my disability. So one of the reasons why I professionally go by the blind soprano is to keep myself honest and to keep myself from that temptation of wiping any mention of disability off of my resume or, you know, out of any emails or things like that, that I send to directors or anyone that I might be auditioning with. Um, and if they don't hire me because of my disability, well, you know, <laughs> then I, I, I will work with somebody else who will and they can <laughs> they can go away and that's okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for that honest answer. Um, Adrian, can you talk a little bit about what disability joy means to you? Sure, this is Adrian speaking and it's lovely to actually be at the end of the line here to hear all these fantastic uh, perspectives. Ophira, I really love that idea of finding the inherent art within community. And I think that very much relates to joy. I think that there is also the inherent art within ourselves and how our bodies play a part in that uh, through our respective disciplines and mediums is uh, something that is as much of a search for this final product of joy as Lloyd was saying, like, leave it, leave nothing off the stage in some way. Uh, and at the same time, that process itself is is joyful in in trying to, as all of us are doing and sort of coming to a certain degree of reckoning and embracing our uh, disability. And, and really incorporating that uh, within our art form in very explicit ways. So, um, and I think about Christine and what she's talking about, some of this idea of, of assimilation within an able-bodied world. I think that's uh, something that I had to uh, contend with when I started going through uh, the classical music system, essentially. And I think I was successful because I could play their game in some way mm -hmm. and 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 do something with, oh, I don't need many accommodations. I don't need to be seen as something different because I can do something that anyone else can. Uh, and and I remember uh, my teacher, uh, my violin teacher saying at the time, and this sort of relates to everyone, so the most important appendages that you have, I'm missing my right arm, by the way, the most important appendages that you have in playing the violin are not your hands, but your ears, because you have to conceptualize and try to find different ways to be able to understand what a great sound is, what a good sound is. Uh, and, and try to use your body and embody uh, something within the art of who you are in order to create that. 
and now even in in this point in time i'm realizing and like seeing lloyd and and uh, incredible artists like Evelyn Glennie, for instance, musicians with hearing impairments, <laughs> you don't even need your ears sometimes. <laughs> it's like, it's just incredible to see um, just the different ways that artists with different disabilities and identities that are uh, wider than just physical disability, sensory disabilities, all these uh, really fine ways to be able to express themselves. Uh, and that's really where I'm finding the joy in that process right now, uh, connecting with other musicians with disabilities, trying to think about how uh, we can create collective impact uh, in ways that uh, allow us to uh, really redefine what it means to explore creativity within the uh, music industry in particular, and I'm speaking specifically from the uh, classical music perspective. Uh, so finding ways to collaborate um, with other musicians who just have uniqueness inherent uh, within their experiences uh, is, is a place where I'm finding a lot of, of joy and creativity. Thank you so much, all of you, for those answers. Yeah, I think in so many areas of life, but particularly in making art, um, there's just something so beautiful and uh, just exciting about how adaptive the human body and the human mind can be. Um, and sort of figuring out, you know, how to make incredible art um, with all of these different bodies and minds is such an engaging, engaging process. And I'm so glad that you guys talked a little bit about your different perspectives with it personally. Um, but I'd kind of like to move now into how you present your disability um, identity to the world. Um, and I'd kind of like to start by discussing disclosure, which is obviously a very personal topic. And we've touched on this a bit about, you know, how, how much do you say and how much do you try to assimilate, uh, assimilate. But I'm curious um, if you could talk, all, all of you could talk a little bit about um, kind of what you disclose and when and how you advocate for yourself and your specific needs. And I'm wondering if you could start us off, Christina. Yes. <laughs> so um, in terms of, you know, how I present my disability and, you know, uh, how I identify, I, I've forced myself to um put that on my resume you know once upon a time i think it was five years ago i didn't and um i had a nervous breakdown if i'm honest because i got um i got fired from a few jobs um because mm -hmm. there were some people you know it, you know who were upset that i hadn't disclosed you know i i got a job specifically to sub for somebody at a church for a while and i you know i walked in and they were they freaked out you know the, the director was just like what and you know i had already asked her what the music was so i had all my music learned i had all of it in braille and you know she didn't have to do anything about it <laughs> And, you know, at the time I was, um, I was, you know, they, they, they went around, they went about it in a not so great way, how they dismissed me, but it was, um, they were upset that I had um, this disability that I hadn't disclosed for one, and they were also upset that I had a guide dog with me. <laughs> um, and, you know, it was, it was, it was uncomfortable for me to have that experience and and I had to really face a few things in terms of, you know, when to disclose. And once upon a time, I, I was really an anxious person. I still am, <laughs> don't get me wrong, but uh, I was really anxious about when to disclose, how I would disclose. Okay, you know, and once upon a time, I made the decision that once I got the audition time or the interview time, whatever you want to call it, I'd email them and say, okay, great. Would someone please be able to keep an eye out for me? I'm going to be coming in with my guide dog, you know, and that would be my way of telling them, PS, I'm blind. And I found that that would sometimes work, but more often than not, uh, it didn't. And, 
you know, they would say, oh, actually, we, we, we have our role filled. Thank you so much. Good luck. And it was just like, are you kidding me? You know, so I and I found that once I finally made the decision to um, go as the blind soprano, and I, I went about that for a couple of reasons, I, I went about it for one to keep myself honest, but also because everybody in the LA area kept calling me that referring to me as uh, the blind soprano when they were talking about me. So it was just like, well, you know, why not? If they're calling me that, I might as well make it, make, make myself identifiable to them. So um, I I started doing that and all of a sudden a lot of work started to come in. And I found that the more honest I was with myself and the more comfortable I was with myself, the more comfortable people were with you know, coming to me and asking me questions. So, and part of my audition process, at, you know, now is once I'm done singing and actually showing them what I can do in terms of, you know, my job goes, I actually invite them to ask me, you know, any question. And I, and I say it in a humorous way because I'm silly at heart. Um, so I, I tend to do that. And that's, that's how I personally disclose. And that's, that's my comfort level, but it's not necessarily, you know, the way to go, but it's, it's what I have found um, makes me comfortable. Yeah, thank you. Disclosure and all of the sort of presentation is, is so personal and so individualized. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, Avira. This is Avira speaking. Um, yeah, I, really relate to, to what you just shared, Christina. Um, there's a lot of similarities with, with my experience. Um, one, one thing with me is when I was doing my Bachelor of Music and, and focusing on voice and, and opera performance, I didn't have the language to even think about disclosure because at the mm -hmm. time for me, I was navigating some new experiences of disability some later to be diagnosed chronic illnesses. And, but at the time I didn't have a clear diagnosis. All I knew was that I was in school. I was trying to pursue this career and my body wasn't doing the thing that I expected it to do. I had migraines. I had sensory issues. I was fainting. I, I was having a lot of sort of medical experiences but I didn't have the language at the time to be able to understand that what I was experiencing was disability. And so I, I put so much effort into just trying to push through, to not talk about it, to not be the quote unquote diva. Um, and I ended up really doing quite a number on myself. I, I put myself in some unsafe situations and I remember I would be in my lessons and I'd go to sing a high note and I'd lose my vision. And I, I felt like this was what art was to just really, and I'd have questions of what can we do to support you? And I, I wouldn't know how to answer. And so I, I do think that's important to acknowledge in the conversation about disclosure is that it's not necessarily just a do you or don't you. Sometimes there's an element of what is the language and how do you start those conversations if you haven't really had the chance to process that identity for yourself. Um, once I started using a power wheelchair, conversations about disclosure kind of went out the window because everywhere <laughs> I go, it's pretty obvious that I am in fact disabled. And right now I, I really embrace that part of my identity and of my crafts and I'm quite front and center. But even within that, I'm multiply disabled. And when I go in for a new experience, I'm very upfront that I'm disabled and that we'll have to have a conversation about accessibility. I don't necessarily go into all of the details of my sensory access needs, of my fatigue and pain related needs. Um, sometimes I do. At this point, I am pretty open, but um, sometimes I let I let myself focus on on the job at hand and kind of hold space for the 
and then we're going to talk and then we're going to set a check-in point later in the process and we're going to talk then too and we'll kind of have this ongoing discussion so those are those are some of my thoughts wonderful thank you for kind of bringing so much nuance uh to that it is it's good to acknowledge that it isn't just like a binary a binary thing um adrian can you talk a bit about your experiences sure this is adrian speaking again so i agree with ophira and christina that it is very mm, subjective in terms of how to disclose and what to disclose as well. And that can change uh, from time to time. I think about disclosure, at least just in a definitional sense, like what is unknown and what are we making known <laughs> in, in some way. I think that the artistic process itself, like we don't have to worry about anything once we're on the concert stage because we are disclosing mm -hmm. our souls, essentially. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> that is what great art is in the end but it's really the process up until there uh that uh is a different type of disclosure that requires an equal at least for me degree of vulnerability i think like uh christina and ophira where like at least i have a very visible disability if someone is uh seeing me play uh they will see oh i'm using an adaptation to hold the bow so that's already obvious and taken care of i think what's more interesting for me is really just disclosing like what i need in order to <laughs> disclose more about myself in some ways um, whether that be specific accommodations uh whether that be uh, the um like if i'm presenting uh, as like on the program, like a disability centered uh, type work, for instance, and really trying to amplify um, just a different perspective. Uh, these are things that, uh, as we were just saying, are ongoing discussions with the people who um, are the gatekeepers and hold some type of power. Those are the employers, the people who are giving you the jobs, the producers, the presenters. Um, and sometimes colleagues, but I often find that like the colleagues that I work with, again, because we're on stage, they're like, oh, okay, you might be doing things a completely different way. You might be using two bows instead of one. Sounds pretty much the same. I mean, the process of just creating a good sound uh, doesn't mean that you all have to look exactly the same, for instance. Uh, so I think that uh, aspect of it is is somewhat easier when we're amongst just people who are making the art. It's really just getting up to that stage where I find the disclosure aspects the most challenging. Yeah, thank you. Um, could you speak to this a bit about presentation and disclosure, Lloyd? Sure. I, I think it's such an interesting, naughty, personal uh sometimes tricky subject as i think has been brought out in this discussion already on this topic um i think i'm really interested in, in that idea that actually orchestras and 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 maybe to a certain degree opera houses and, and classical music in general is very often um at least on a surface level is is kind of about assimilating as performers or, or we're kind of taught that we must assimilate as, as performers especially when we're younger and when we're at music college um being orchestral musicians you know we're taught how to blend our sounds and how to blend our um our our music with other musicians and how to kind of create sonorities and harmonies that sing together and i i'm quite uh, kind of interested in how the, the sort of how that can then turn into it can almost go a step too far and turn into something where people then feel like they have to um hide or not disclose a disability because they are um fearful of of uh, not um kind of you know being being in that overall 
um, picture in, in that kind of um, in that 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 very sort of identikit uh, mode of 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 making orchestral music. Um, I think for me personally, I. I, I think ever since I was young, I've been sort of really taught to to disclose um, my disability. Um, I have a, a hearing impairment and a vision impairment, as I mentioned, but neither of them are particularly visible. Um, maybe when you first meet me, I'm, I, I wear glasses, um, but my vision impairment is not um, kind of fully uh, corrected by wearing glasses. I have a condition called nystagmus, which very often makes it tricky to focus on the small print of reading music so again it's a a really interesting thing that I'm able to read music but very often I will need to make sure that I prepare uh, the music that much kind of harder ahead of of taking it into a rehearsal room with colleagues um, really study the music in kind of quite some detail sort of two to three weeks sometimes four or five six weeks um, maybe ahead of what a colleague would be doing just so that I can actually um, memorize a lot of the music um, or, or really get it under my fingers because I know that I can't rely to the same degree on sight reading um, and I think uh, I've always been uh, I, I think I really am a great believer in 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 that thing of if you're comfortable with your disability yourself and if you kind of wear it with with pride then it really enables other people to be um, comfortable with it um, and enables them to to ask questions um, about it and I'm very happy to ask answer questions about my disability so um, yeah I I think in short I'm I'm definitely if anyone was ever to kind of ask me for advice on it I would say that that you know it's definitely better to disclose even if it's not always easy to get to that point of being comfortable to do so Um, I also recognise that actually, you know, I say that from a position of someone who is, at least in the UK, I'm a form of gatekeeper because of my role with Power Orchestra. I have an associate music director role where I'm employing other musicians and and, and finding other musicians to work with and to join our orchestra. Um, And by virtue of the fact that I work for the Power Orchestra, many people kind of um, understand or, or very often assume that I have a disability and might ask you know oh um, do you identify as disabled so I say that just because I, I know that that actually makes my life a lot easier in some ways that you know there's kind of an expectation that I have a disability right. um, so yeah those are my reflections on that. That's that's so so interesting this is this is Julia speaking um, and now kind of shifting to our focus to allyship and how individuals, both able-bodied and disabled, um, can best make spaces for um, other disabled artists. Uh, I'd love to kind of hear you guys discuss what it means to you um, that someone is a true ally um, alongside other disabled musicians or alongside disabled musicians. Um, Could you get us started with that, Lloyd? Sure, I I think um, there is, there has to be a recognition first that disabled people at the moment, um, with some uh, isolated examples, are not getting their fair share of um, the spotlight and the on the concert platform. So there has to be, I think, before the conversation is had around allyship, I think there has to be that Um, acknowledgement for I can only speak from my experience here in the UK but you know working age population uh, of the UK about 20 percent of people identify as as disabled Um, the number of people in the UK workforce uh, orchestral workforce who have a disability is uh, I think just under between two and three percent so there's a massive gap, you know, even and, and actually there are question marks around whether those statistics are even fully accurate. And, and actually the picture may be maybe worse than that in some ways. Um, so I think we have to start with that with that recognition that the playing field literally has not been level um, for all disabled people to this point. Um, and I think 
the thing I'm most uh, keen to see and most passionate about is uh, those traditional um, orchestras where visible disabled representation has not been as high as it should be um, really do something about it um, which goes beyond there's a cliche again I don't know if this is I'm interested to hear if this is the case in the states but in the UK there's a bit of a cliche around um, uh, consigning work or engaging with disabled people uh, to the kind of education and outreach part of um, orchestral and, and classical music programs and not actually engaging with artists who are disabled in the main, in the core kind of main part of your program as a, as a theatre or as an opera house or as a, as a symphony orchestra. So I think there's, there's something there about really engaging um, fully and properly with the issue of underrepresentation of disabled people in the classical music workforce and not going to um, a shortcut you know, and, and doing, and don't get me wrong, it kind of education work and music therapy work with um, uh, special educational needs, it, you know, it's all brilliant and, and vitally important, but that is a different thing to, you know, having artists who are world-class um, gracing our stages and our platforms and our, um, you know, the, the airwaves who also are disabled. They, they are two different um, conversations in my view. Yeah, that that is a fascinating and yeah, um, that's really interesting to think about that distinction. Um, and I'm curious, um, Adrian, what what's your perspective on this? I loved a lot of what Lloyd was saying. Uh, I think his previous answer too, like, uh, really spoke to this to a certain extent. Like the acknowledgement of a privilege where we have it. And then also understanding, as you were saying, Julia, uh, the disability is not a monolith. <laughs> and right. that there are, there's such complexity and, and learning and humility uh, that is involved for all of us. Like I think about my specific role uh, as an artist with a disability and, and I feel like I have so much to learn and grow in terms of understanding the ongoing and never ending complexity of how human beings are made and how yeah. they can produce art, as you are saying, uh, using various adaptations at their disposal and, and to be able to celebrate that by being as supportive as possible. And that can mean many different things uh, for folks. Um, it could be uh, something like producers versus centering uh, disability uh, in core programming rather than having it a novelty in some capacity. Uh, for others and performing art centers, it's ensuring that all your venues are uh, accessible. I mean, even on uh, meetings like this, making sure that you have interpreters, you have folks who are really providing as much access as possible uh, to be able to transmit heart art uh, in a way that allows us to recognize uh, that, you know, I, I always think about this, that we we talk about dis disability, but it's also like we are currently disabled <laughs> or not. Right. There, every single person in existence will experience a disability at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and this idea of sometimes from a completely selfish perspective, the more that you're supporting artists with disabilities and really embracing the complexity of what that means, uh, you're really um, creating pathways of access for all of those uh, that you care about in your life and especially yourself too. Yeah, um, this is Julia, thank you. Uh, it is so interesting. I think what you brought up about, you know, this lifelong learning for everyone involved, I think is so, is so critical because 
there's so much under, you know, the broad category of disability. Um, and, you know, even people with the same disabilities have such different experiences of making art. Uh, so I think that's a fascinating point to bring up and just how human disability is, is also so important to keep in mind. Um, Ophira, what, what would you like to add to this um, conversation? This is Ophira speaking. I, my brain's spinning in all of the directions because I really, I really agree with so much of, of what's been said already. I think understanding that the status quo isn't neutral is really important. Mm -hmm. um, we do, and by we, I mean any, any theater, any performance space, any organization is already accommodating. We do that left, right, and center, right? We don't expect an audience to stand for a three-hour performance. We, you know, we even, most composers uh, acknowledge that singers need to breathe at some point when <laughs> they're singing. Like these are not, new, it's not that some people require accommodation and some people don't. But the question becomes, who are we holding that space for? Who are we welcoming onto our stages and who are we not? And so I think that's an important understanding. And I really very much echo this idea. I think there's sometimes a fear of getting it wrong or that it's something's either accessible or, is it, or it isn't accessible. And truly what's accessible for one person, I mean, I can say I personally require sort of a calmer sensory environment, a bit lower lighting, a little bit more time. I have a friend with a different disability who their main access needs are to move around and make noise and not feel judged for their expression in that way. Our ideal environments are gonna look a little bit different. Our access <laughs> looks different. Um, and so there isn't necessarily that pressure to have it right or to have it 100% accessible. The idea is to build a framework that can hold people, that sees everyone who comes into the space as human, that gives them agency to be able to bring their full selves to their work. Um, and on the funding fronts, another sort of consideration Sometimes it can be nerve wracking to ask for an accommodation that you need or as an organization to take the leap, especially if it costs money. But after, it gets easier after the first time, right? I had, there was a theater that wasn't, that was, there, there were only stairs up to it. The theater bought a crank lift for me to go up. Well, now they have a crank lift for anyone else. <laughs> Who wants to go up as well, right? So there's a lot, a lot of these things that once you start expanding who you're welcoming onto your stages and spaces, that stays. It doesn't have to go anywhere and you can hold space for all of those brilliantly talented artists as Lloyd was mentioning as well. This is Juliet. Thank you. I just, I loved sort of those themes of humanity and agency and not having a right answer but just sort of embracing all this complexity i think so much of um access and inclusion discussion is is so nuanced and it's so complicated but that sort of i think the those complexities are really kind of i mean to bring it back to the beginning of our conversation are kind of artistic stimulating in a lot of really interesting ways because there because there isn't a just a right answer. Um, Christina, what would you would you like to add to this? So first of all, I, I, I would definitely love to say that I agree with every single person's answers <laughs> just because they they resonate so deeply. And it's it's true. Like everything is very well it's it's nuanced, but it's it's also not I I don't think it's also, I don't think it's as difficult as we sometimes like to make it, <laughs> um, you know, because I think, I think, you know, a lot of people get caught up in trying to do things right or do it, you know, do things by the book or things like that. And it's like, well, sometimes by the book doesn't work for everybody. And sometimes it's not written in the book. So mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, one of the things about 
us being, you know, creators, artists, is that we can creatively find ways to accommodate ourselves and also, you know, allies can help to find creative ways to accommodate us. And I think, you know, one of the, one of, you know, the memories that has stayed with me the longest is when I was at um, Cal State Fullerton, I was taking part in opera scenes and it was my first set of opera scenes and they, they cast me as Despina, which is a very energetic, um, sassy maid. And I, I was just like, I have no idea how you guys want me to run around this stage, you know? And it wasn't me that came up with an idea for an accommodation. It was the director who did. And she's, you know, she has no disability herself. And it was something that I took with me for, you know, and I've taken with me and it's stayed with me for the rest. And it will stay with me for the rest of my life. You know, that she was the one who thought of, hey, this is a way we can make this work. And so she had me use the duster very aggressively and it was a character choice. And, you know, I was just banging around everywhere and, you know, the duster would hit things before I would. And so I kind of (laughs) used this as a makeshift cane and I think that's, you know, that's, that's something that can be carried across the board for one, not, not necessarily aggressively using dusters that's frowned upon, but, um, but just, you know, being, being able to be creative about how we, how we come up with different kinds of accommodations for ourselves and for the people around us. Um, one of the things that I'm really passionate about too is making disability both visible and invisible more normalized Mm -hmm. on and off the page screen and stage um and i mean you know if there is an opera chorus for instance you know having a couple of people be disabled (laughs) in the you know or something or even in the in the in the main cast or whatever just because i think the more and more people see people with disabilities out and about, the more comfortable people will be. And, you know, which means that the more likely we're not going to be a novelty when we walk through the door or something, you know. Um, And I think that that should be on and off, you know, presentation wise, like, you know, on and off the camera, um, you know, behind the scenes, it's it doesn't matter. I think that um, people with disabilities need to be represented and represented authentically. Um, and I also think that people with disabilities and, uh, you know, people without disabilities as well, we all need to be willing to share resources. I think, um, a lot of times we have this scarcity mindset of, oh my gosh, there's a, there's a job and they're looking for, uh, you know, this specific thing, uh, you know, okay, it's all mine. All these roles are mine, you know, (laughs) and um you know for instance i did the role yolanta which is a um she's a blind princess from a a tchaikovsky sorry tchaikovsky opera last year and you know someone made the comment of oh great now you have this monopoly and i was like oh heck no like this this should be something that all blind sopranos now should do not not that we all should and only should play blind (laughs) characters but you know, I, I don't think that it's fair or right for me to sit there and say, oh, well, great, now I have this monopoly and it's only mine. And, you know, sharing, not being afraid to share resources and say, hey, you know what, you would be great doing this. Why don't you, why don't you pass this along? Or, you know, being willing to share those resources, like, you know, where, where you got something and things like that. And I think those, those kinds of things are very important and go a long way also. Thank you so much. Um, and that was a fantastic note to end on. This is Julia speaking. And I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists. I learned so much from this conversation and um, I feel so lucky <laughs> to have gotten to be a part of it. And um, I just think these themes that you guys kind of intertwined throughout the evening of creativity and flexibility and um but at the same time really working and advocating for these these spaces where um, more and hopefully all bodies and minds can be welcomed and included is is so powerful and um ultimately pretty uplifting too (laughs) and i like that note that we ended on too of of sharing all of these resources 
um, and sharing the knowledge that we are gathering and continuing to learn for, you know, for disabled people and non-disabled people alike, um, there's always so much more to learn in this space. And so um, I'm really grateful that we could have this conversation tonight uh, to expand that knowledge. And all of you um, attending will receive a recording of this event. And along with that, you will receive resources um, that are kind of ways for you to learn more about these topics and engage with them further by um, links to um, professional disabled musicians and organizations that are really working to expand um, classical music and the music industry in general to, to make it more accessible and inclusive for everyone. And tonight was also a great start for tomorrow night's event, which will be a networking event built around conversation and community building for anyone who identifies as a disabled musician. And we are so looking forward to that event and hope that if you are a disabled musician, you will join us at um, 7 p.m. Eastern tomorrow night as well. Um, thank you, all of you, for tuning into this, um, for being a part of this, for learning alongside us. And again, a huge thank you to our panelists. This is Roberto. Thank you for joining us. Information about upcoming webinars and events can be found at accessvsa.org. That's A-C-C-E-S-S-V-S-A dot -S 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 Until next time.